Morning, ladies and gents. Simon Brown here. Uh, no Denea this morning. She has been load shed, so can't get on. Uh, so just me going solo, which is not a particular worry. We can manage that. And then we're going to kick off with uh, the offshore markets initially, as always. Um, and generally, markets are just strong. Uh, the, the, just everything all over the place. Uh, certainly, we're seeing it uh, in, in, in U.S. markets, but even global, even locally, rather. Um, and then offshore markets. I mean, the uh, Cacaron 40 out of France hitting all-time highs. But uh, the, the big news coming out on uh, fr at, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday evening our time, was that the U.S. is going to start their tapering. Um, and what that essentially means is that Jerome Powell and his team have been buying $120 billion of bonds uh, during the pandemic. And this is to inject liquidity into markets. Um, and it has had largely worked. What we're now seeing from that is that they're going to start pulling back on that. So they're cutting in November by 15 billion. So they'll buy 105. Uh, they'll cut December by another 15 billion, taking it down to 90 for December. Important couple of important points, um, and let me go and let's pull up some of these indices that are looking quite so very very strong. Some important points here. Firstly, is that they're still buying, and let's be clear: 105 billion in November, 90 billion in December. These are big numbers. Uh, if they're gliding at 15 billion a month, cutting back, which is not what they have said, they've given no timeline beyond November, December, uh, then that takes us to around the middle of next year when we will finally see the end of the, 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 the bond buying from the US. But they're leaving themselves wiggle room in case something goes wrong, in case some wheels, yeah, just sort of just in case. But in essence, they're saying, you know what, hey, this economy is strong enough and kudos to the friend to the fed i mean when they when they tried to sort of pause quantitative easing uh was it 2013 markets had an absolute hissy fit this time it's been incredibly well communicated to markets so when it was officially announced on on wednesday the markets were sure i mean not a problem like we're cool with that uh which is uh, kudos to the fed and if we counter that with Bank of England, which left rates unchanged and did see a hissy fit coming through. And the reason for that is, is, is really uh, quite simple, is that the, 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 the Bank of England had very much been suggesting that, yeah, there was probably a, 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 uh, a rate cut coming um, and, uh, sorry, rate increase, when we're talking rate cuts, uh, rate increase coming uh, and therefore, you know, probably sooner rather than later. And simply what happened was they didn't. They, they they pulled it. And and it's not, yeah, the cold feet, I mean, lots of debate around that. But it's so important in terms of how central banks speak. I mean, that, that is perhaps as important as, 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 you know, what they're actually doing is that what are they saying? How are they saying it? How are they literally communicating with markets? Um, and and you know we, we see it with our local governor, who's always talked around inflation of four and a half percent target. He never talks about the three to six percent range. Uh, we've seen it with the Federal Reserve, who. I've been talking around this tapering since, what, middle of the year. Uh, and at the last meeting said probably November. And at this meeting they said, well, it's November, and so here we are. And you want that sort of move happening. So we've seen a fairly marked uh, sell-off in, 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 in the, in, in the uh, uh, pound uh, on, on, on that news. The market was not happy with it at all. Um, someone was asking about that. Yeah, quick look at uh, the Russell 2000. This is the mid-cap index that has finally, sorry, small cap index, finally, after pretty much going sideways for all of this year, has finally broken out. We might get a bit of a pullback. Uh, I think IWM uh, is the, the, the code for it, um, for the ETF in the US. We might get a bit of a pullback around that 23,600, 2320 sort of level, uh, but this has been a long, long consolidation. And if we zoom out over a five-year period, um, there was a previous, and of course the sell-off, a, a significant run, a massive run up to there, and then just sideways and, and going nowhere. So U.S. is tapering, uh, interest rate increases. 
Probably second half of next year. Uh, the curves and everything else is, is is saying that. The Fed is saying 2023, but I think they're going to start pulling those expectations perhaps a little bit uh, closer. And the reason for that is uh, job start in the U.S. So non-farm payrolls for October, very strong. 531,000, uh, that was a really good number. Uh, chunk of that, 180, 200,000 in hospitality, no surprises there. But also big revisions for August and September, which added about another 200 odd thousand, um, just overall making it a, a much better looking number. A couple of points in there, our, unempl- our unemployment rate, the unemployment rate has now dropped to 4.6%. Not quite yet back at uh, pre-pandemic levels where it was sub uh, 4%, but certainly the best by a long way during this pandemic. Um, the U6 which is uh, unemployed, but including because unemployment says unemployment rate says if you're not looking for a job, you're unemployed, but you're discouraged. You can't, you don't believe you're going to find a job, so you stop looking. You're not considered unemployed. You're considered discouraged. It's stats. If we include dis- discouraged, that number is now dropped just below eight uh, percent. Uh, the labor participation rate, um, and where is that here? Uh, labor force participation rate. Still 61.6. This number has been coming down. Let's go for a 10-year. Um, and you can see that the trend was coming down, a little bit of, a, of an uptick in those last couple of years there. That to a degree is uh, the baby boomers essentially moving into, into retirement. Um, so th- you know, th- those are folks who are just no longer in the, the job market whatsoever. Um, but there's another trend that we saw because we, you know, we've gone from, the US has gone from around 62.8 down to 61.6. And I think what's happened is a couple of things. When you've spoken about it before, some folks are sitting at home on the unemployment benefits that they were receiving, uh, no worried about that. But also some people just pulled forward retirement. I was reading an article over the weekend uh, by someone, and he was just a you know, a normal corporate individual, nothing fancy or anything like that, you know, not a truck driver or a boss or anything, um, and just someone working, a, a, a white-collar worker in the U.S. Uh, and when, and when, when he got called back into the office earlier this year, he was three years away from normal retirement age. Uh, it was a two years, a couple of years from normal retirement age. He got called back into the office, uh, you know, the, the, the work from home is over, come work in the office again. But he's got fairly severe comorbidities. And he was like, you know what, actually, he took early retirement instead. And I think we're going to see a bunch of that. We've heard a lot of that around in in the trucker space, in the UK, in the US, and other various different places where it it is a case of folks are saying, yeah, no, actually, I think I'm going to just take that early retirement. So this might be, I suspect, a new set if we go all the way out. I mean, you know, we, we can see, as I said, baby boomers, particularly sort of post-2010 going into retirement. Uh, and I think we're probably reset at a lower rate. I think that is probably just it. Now, uh, that, 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 that white-collar worker who takes a couple of years, years early retirement, I mean, the, the, the crux of the article was not that he retired early or anything like that. Uh, the crux of the article is that now he's pursuing uh, his, 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 his sort of hustle and, and generating some income there. So he's not completely lost. He's now just sort of self-employed. It's not a 40-hour a week, and it's certainly not a full pension or full salary by any stretch, but uh, I think we are going to see a little more losses in that space. As I said, from the numbers that came through, really big numbers coming in the hospitality space. That's no surprises um, as the U.S. uh, opens up. One thing we did see is that the average Hourly wage is up 4.9% on a year ago. Uh, that is inflationary. And we've talked about that. We're going to talk a lot more about inflation uh, as, as, as in, in the months and probably years ahead. But uh, 4.9% is a chunky. And that's, you know, how do you get people who don't want to work back to work? Well, you offer them better perks of the job. And one of those perks is, as always, is going to be, well, what do you pay me? Quite simple. Uh, the U.S. has also finally passed their infrastructure bill, uh, $1 trillion. So a whole lot smaller than talk back in January when Biden was initially uh, inaugurated. Uh, be that as it may, a trillion dollars is a huge amount of money. And this is going to go into roads, bridges. Uh, it will go into broadband. I mean, all of those sort of capacity things. And it, it, it's hugely important. I've spoken about it before. 
in an ideal world, you need to build the infrastructure before it's needed, right? So that people can get in uh, ahead. You know, you, you don't want to build the infrastructure when the roads are busy. You want to build the new roads so that they're ready for when they get busy. Now, America did that, right? Back in the first, the railways, then the highways, uh, ports. But they haven't really over the last 30, 40, 50 years. A lot of the infrastructure is old and creaking, particularly uh, simple things like water, uh, bridges and the like. But a trillion dollars is goes a long, long way. Uh, two benefits from that. One is potentially Murray and Roberts. Remember, they've just recently acquired a U.S. construction firm. And when I spoke to Henry Loss, he made it quite clear that you know they weren't buying it for the existing business; they were buying it to plug into their to to, to the existing contracts. Rather, they were buying it to plug into their 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 uh, their U.S. operations to try and and pick up on some of that infrastructure work. It's not a walk in the park. It is going to be a massively competitive market, and you know Marion Roberts is just going to be one of many. We'll see how that goes. The other, of course, is commodities. Think steel, iron ore, uh, think copper. I mean, all of those that go into building. You know, every building's got tons and tons of copper. All the, you know, they, they've got uh, uh, steel. We're going to be seeing a large amount of that. And that then bodes well for those commodity prices. Iron ore, I'm not expecting to suddenly go rushing back to, to sort of record levels in any stretch, but it does certainly say that you know, iron ore is good for probably staying uh, north of or around about the 100 a ton. Uh, copper, certainly, I can see more records coming through there. Question, where do we get copper exposure in South Africa? Directly, you don't. Um, your best is Anglo. Uh, BHP's got some. Sabanya Stillwater just bought those copper assets down in Brazil, which they announced uh, just two weeks ago. Um, but in, in, on our market, we don't have any direct copper. There is Orion, uh, who will be a copper, they're a copper nickel, zinc, I think is their collection. But they're still in ramp up stage. They're not yet producing at all. Um, strong Pfizer results. I've been saying keep an eye on the 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 uh, uh, drug manufacturers, and most notably, obviously, uh, Pfizer was on that list. Now, the story is, and and I'll quickly rehash it, is that the just the vaccines has suddenly become a about a seventy five billion dollar industry in the medical space uh, per year. Uh, add to that the messenger RNA, which is something we didn't really know about a year ago, uh, although technically we did. I mean, this is technology that that woman discovered in the early 2000s, uh, but now suddenly we're using it. And now the, the drug manufacturers are looking at it for malaria. They're looking at it for cancer and various other different uh, treatments at the same time. So huge uh, happening there. And this kind of gives them, uh, the, the, the drug companies, almost a new space into which they can be start operating in. And of the drug manufacturers, there was Moderna in the listed. There was Pfizer. There was Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson is more home care product, and then they've got their jab, make no mistake. Um, and, of course, it's not messenger RNA. Uh, Moderna and Pfizer are the two who've got the messenger RNA. Pfizer in conjunction with the German uh, company. Uh, so uh, of that, my pick was uh, Pfizer. We can see if we zoom out on this chart. Actually, let's go to a, a five-year. Um, you can see the excitement uh, on the initial announcement towards the end there, uh, end of last year, uh, pulled back a fair bit, been running fairly hard, and those results were, they were good results, but of course then the, the Philip, the, the, the booster that came through from the uh, 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 vaccines. Now, they didn't take any Operation Warp Speed money from the U.S. government, um, and essentially what the U.S. government did was, Operation Warp Speed was, two parts to the process. One, your FDA approval process is typically a linear process, and instead they did them in serial. So, you know, they would be doing parts that they, they, you know, they would be doing the approval process while still doing the trials, um, and then if the trials failed, they would just pull the approval process. What Warp Speed also did was, frank, was, was to start building the capacity to manufacture the vaccines even though we only ended up with a handful of them and a bunch of them that they thought might come. They built the capacity and the vaccine never qualified because it wasn't, didn't have the efficacy, so it got cancelled. But that's what the Operation Warp Speed was. Pfizer didn't take money. So all of this profit is theirs, except, of course, they're sharing it with uh, the Germans who actually have got the tech, who, who sort of got the tech. So the, 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 the drug space um, is certainly looking a lot stronger. And I've always been... 
concerned about this sector for a simple reason is I've worried about legislative risk. So I've kind of liked the hospital REITs, in other words, the actual physical buildings. I've kind of liked the equipment supplies, you know, your scanners and, and, and that sort of thing, hospital beds and all of those. Um, but the drug manufacturers and the hospital, hospitals themselves, I've had concerns, and my concerns has been quite simply that the uh, healthcare costs have been running well ahead of inflation for a number of decades now, and governments will and are starting to crack down. Um, we saw it with uh, Obamacare in the US. We've seen it with single exit pricing in South Africa, uh, NHI proposals in South Africa. That very much is the, the, the concern around those increase in costs. Where does that ultimately go to? I think that in terms of this vaccine, this probably gives the drug companies a bit of a window when they can make some hay. Um, and if they can find some other drugs using messenger RNA, that will be a, a, a big deal for them, most definitely. So uh, there's a window of opportunity here. At some point, they've got to be careful, right? There's a tipping balance. If, if you know, three years down the line, uh, poor people can't access a, a COVID vaccine, uh, then, then governments are going to start knocking again. Make no mistake about that. Uh, but for now, really, really good numbers here. And then perhaps the strangest thing I was going to say over the weekend, but perhaps even more than just over the weekend, Elon Musk went on Twitter uh, and made the comment that uh, that 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 he, he he's not paying tax on all of his massive wealth because he hasn't sold right so he doesn't earn a salary or anything so really he's not paying any tax so he then said well hey should I sell ten percent of my Tesla stock which would then uh, uh, generate a massive capital gains tax and he put it to the vote on Twitter three and a half million votes monster of which. 57.9% said yes. So he said he would abide by the results of this poll, whichever way it goes. I mean, does he? Truthfully, we don't know. I mean, time will tell. But he has the math of it. So he owns 20.7% of Tesla uh, at current prices. That's 10% of that. It's about $25 billion. He would then pay tax on that 25 billion uh what's their cgt so he would pay about 8 billion or so over in tax um and then of course he's got the rest 17 billion in cash now i think it's an excellent idea right give the, the treasury 8 billion uh that's nice and, and you know they've just announced a what a, a trillion uh, uh infrastructure 8 billion is relatively small cash but nonetheless um but here's the, the uh, you know, and, and, and then take what's left, call it 15 billion. I mean, just go buy treasury bonds. You never have to work again. He's probably going to pour it into space, space, SpaceX or some project or something like that. But a couple of thoughts. Firstly, he's coming. We've got some 2% of Tesla stock potentially coming onto the market. We don't know if he's going to, and we don't know how he sells it. We, he might just do it in a, in a, blo in a book over to, to, to somebody. Who knows? Just, we, we don't know how this will happen. But 2% uh, of Tesla stock suddenly hitting the market is, is not insignificant. Uh, it certainly does put some pressure there. And then, of course, in short-term pressure, the market will absorb it. It'll take a bit, and then it'll be off to the races. Uh, then, of course, there is the skeptics out there who are saying, hang on a second, this is a chronically overvalued stock. He can't be seen to be selling. So how about kind of you know doing this? And, and this gives him a neat way out saying, well, I didn't want to, but the Twitter users said I should go and pay some tax. I mean, and that is the jaundice view. Make no mistake about that. But yeah, maybe it is. I mean, the, the bigger issue is, is he going to actually do it? Is he going to sell 10% of his holdings or not? Um, it would still leave him with 18-odd uh, percent. It would still leave him a significant stake in Tesla. It would still leave him the richest man in the world by a very, very long way. Uh, but uh, time will tell. Um, this poll has ended, uh, and I can't remember, I think it ended late last night, so I suspect that he's probably sleeping. We'll wait for him to wake up and let us know what his plan is. On that point, U.S. Has, has changed their clocks, which means U.S. markets are now opening at 4.30, uh, U.K. markets opening at 10 a.m., uh, all of it an hour later because they've changed for summertime. Uh, let's come back to some local. So we've got the uh, mini budget this week, medium term budget policy statement coming from a uh, new finance minister. Uh, anything much to expect? I think the two things that the world is mostly looking for 
again, uh, more tax receipts than, than initially expected in the February budget. And the reason for that is quite simple. Uh, thank you, commodities, uh, both agricultural and uh, uh, the iron ores and, and the PGMs of the world. Those massive prices have been uh, significantly helping. The massive dividend payments in mid-year from the, the PGM and Kumba and the like significantly helping as well. A bunch of that flows, you know, Anglo Platinum, Kumba Iron Ore flows to London, a lot of it because uh, they're the majority held by Anglo American. But nonetheless, uh, really good uh, tax receipts, so we'll get good boost coming in that. Uh, will we get any sort of extension to the uh, 350 Rand COVID grant? I don't mean extension in terms of rands and cents, in terms of time. Probably not, because currently it runs until March, and we've got a budget in February, so we can park that there. Uh, any changes to Regulation 28? Expectation is more baking in of the ability to invest into infrastructure. A lot of rumors swirling around that you will be able to draw out some of your Reg 28 money early. Uh, can remember at this point you can only draw it out at the age of 55. If you take it out early, uh, maybe they'll do some sort of window around about that. I know there's a fair bit of support, particularly from unions, um, although not a lot of support from asset managers because, look, A, truthfully, it's not a good idea. Although if you have no other money at this point in time, it's better than nothing. But, of course, the asset managers also will lose some of their uh, 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 assets under management as a result. And other than that, I, I'm not expecting anything giant to come out of this. Um, it's usually a fairly short statement from the minister. Uh, it is Thursday. Uh, so Thursday, 2 o'clock, we will get that from the uh, finance minister. Um, and then moving on to some local. So let's start with Purple first. Uh, Purple Group, who own uh, Easy Equities as their key asset, um, and that is since listing in 99. So that's what, a 22, 23 years worth of chart uh, back at their pre-crisis levels, back at their uh, uh, early 2000 levels. Someone was asking me on Twitter, what did they start life as? And I honestly don't know. I only really discovered them in sort of 2005, six. Uh, Mark Barnes, they had some mezzanine finance, they had some bond originators, they had GT247, and I'd, beyond that. Anyway, they had an update on Friday and I hold this stock that was stellar. I, if I, it's, I've been, I, I was expecting softer numbers from Purple, not from Easy Equities. Not that they would go uh, backwards or that they would lose money, but that growth in the second half of their financial year, in other words, March to August, would be a little bit slower than in the first half or certainly uh, what we saw last year. And the reason is quite simple, and we've seen clues from PSG Consult, we've seen clues from the JSC themselves, is that trading volumes are down. And, and, and I expect no different to have that be happening at uh, Purple uh, in terms of, of you know, just lower trading levels uh, because there's, there's less volatility. There's no sass at 20 bucks or, or you know, all of those sort of crazy prices that we had last year that sucked people in. And, and truthfully, they did incredibly well in most cases. So I, I thought a week H2 and I was fundamentally wrong. That trading update and results are due, I think, Wednesday. Uh, trading update is staggering numbers. So there's some bits and moving parts here, etc. Uh, but uh, improved from 14 million in the previous period profit to let's call it 44 to 45 million. Uh, that's a massive, massive number. Now, there are some. T's and C's and tweaks in this. Um, the the if we look at Easy Equities itself, profit of around 100 million, up from 12 million, but uh, 50 of that million is a fair value adjustment um, on their stake in a fair value adjustment. 50 million raised relation to option to acquire a 51% stake in Easy Crypto Proprietary Limited, which has. Uh, 100,000 easy clients and uh, 500 million invested into that bundle. But let's strip that out. If we remove that from the easy equities component, uh, they're still making 50 million, whereas the previous period they made 12. It, it just, it, 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 they had a really, really good H2. Now, they didn't do that by getting their customers each spending more uh, on their trading accounts, I very much suspect they did that by new customers. 
they are signing up hand over fist. Easy Equities itself, of course, they've got the white label with Satrix. The Satrix Now platform runs on them. They've got the app in the Capitech, uh, 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 or the widget within the Capitech banking app. That's obviously signing up people. Um, they've signed up with uh, Discovery Bank. I, I don't expect that to be huge. Um, I think that's just a tick box for Discovery. I don't, I mean, I, you know, I think the high net worth clients who Discovery Bank are targeting probably already have uh, uh, brokerage accounts and are probably not in a mad rush necessarily to move to easy equities. And certainly the higher value clients uh, uh, typically get a slightly better rate than you would normally get. So they're not that far from the 0.25%. But this is a phenomenal run in, 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 in purple. As I said, I was really expecting some weakness. This is the person who dumped a whole bunch of shares back on the 27th of September and uh, call that six weeks later, the share has almost doubled the buck 25 that it traded down at. And it was just, it's just been crazy, been absolutely crazy. 231, uh, someone was saying the stock is still trading on about a 50, four, a 50 historic PE. Uh, yeah, it absolutely is. But the question is, you know, how fast can it grow? So it's going to do some four odd cents earnings, four and a half cents earnings per share. Uh, how fast can it continue? If it's growing, at around the, the, the 30, 40, 50 percent, then that forward PE very quickly unravels. Here's the thing. I've been trying to mow my head around. Where does Easy get to? And I ignore the other bits of the business. In fact, their GT business, I think they should sell because it keeps on losing money. Their Emperor asset doesn't thrill me. I think they should get rid of that as well. I think they should basically become the Easy Equities. Keep the crypto business, that's fine, but really they should be the Easy Equities part. But you know, where do they tap out? I mean, they're going to probably have a, a million accounts. I don't know how many are going to be active, but and I started running some numbers. Is it possible, and bear with me a moment, for Easy Equities to get to 10 million active accounts? And that sounds completely insane. But why not? And, and, and not in a hurry. This could take them another decade, maybe even two. But you suddenly start to think about it, and you think, well, I mean, look what Capitec did. I mean, why not 10 million accounts? And then if they're doing, uh, they've got 10 million accounts and they're making 100 rand profit per account, just 100 rand, that's all. That's a billion rand profit. Boom. Put them on a 20 PE, that's a, uh, a 20 billion rand company. That is a 23 rand share price. Now, we're talking a, a, a long way out. We're talking a, a very, very long way out. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's not impossible. Uh, easy could t be a 10-bagger from here. Now, the folks who were buying back here when there were some big sellers at 30 cents and basically put a lid, lid on the price, you're laughing because you're like, yeah, man, I'm already sitting at nine bags. Like, I've only got one more to go for 10. I hear you. But uh, could this become a, a, an even bigger? I mean, it is. it, it sounds improbable, but it's not... It's not completely out of the realm of 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 uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of 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 possibility. The other big news last week, and another stock which I own as well, is Renogen. Uh, they're the little gas helium business down in the uh, Free State. And if the question anyone ever asks you is where do you find helium, well, the answer is the Free State. So they had two announcements last week. One was on Tuesday, which basically said that their flow rate coming out of their existing wells was better than expected, um, quite, ni quite nicely so. And the market quite liked that view as well. Uh, but then the really, really big news, which came out on Wednesday, was their reserves. So they had gone back and revisited the reserves in the ground. And when I say them, it's experts who do it, and I'll touch on that in a moment. Short answer is their helium reserve is 620% bigger than expected, and their methane reserve, I think, 417% bigger than expected. Hence, the massive spike up to, let's rather look at a daily chart here, the massive spike up uh, on Wednesday to 42 Rand. Uh, just, yeah. Um, we then saw some, some, some pullback, and I'll come to that in a second. So reserves in terms of mining is a very, it's, it's, it's a science and art, right? And what I mean by that is that, I mean, you don't really know what's underground. So you've got to go and, I mean, there's lots of science involved, but there's also lots of guessing. So you've got, um, in, in Australia, you've got, I think this is the JREC. In South Africa, we've got the SAMREC, uh, South African Mineral Exploration uh, Codes. Um, and, and that's how you define it. So 
the difference between inferred and a reserve and et cetera, et cetera, is critically important. And then the big question is, who's the person who's doing it? Are, are they someone that is trustable and the like? And, and they give p the competent person statement. There it is. And they give lots of details around the competent person. Jeffrey B. B. Eldridge, uh, senior geoscientist, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And petroleum is a particular type of way of doing it. It's a different... You don't use the Samarik. Samarik is for gold and coal and that sort of thing. Australians have got their own, and then you use a particular one, which is the Certified Petroleum Geologists, and you, you run those ones. So I've gone and checked out. He's legit. He belongs to legit association. Uh, there's no expectation that this is in any way uh, a scam or something. But there are a couple of rift buts and maybes here. Firstly, they're going to get phase one up this year. Uh, then they've got to cool it. They'll stop, probably start flowing production and getting sales February or March. Phase two, which is due in 2024, is going to cost 12 billion czar to get going. 12 billion. Now, they can raise some of that from those helium tokens they launched a couple of weeks ago. They can raise some of it from bank loans and a rights issue probably. But that's why the price came back. It's in the ground. That's excellent. But there's a long way to getting that to be a saleable product I mean, at least three to four years and rights issues en route, et cetera, et cetera, which is why at 42 Rand, I think the stock had, had overrun itself. It is a good news story and there is potentially a lot of profit that can come from this company, but uh, it's still loss making. And go look at David Shapiro's tweet from Wednesday last week. And he's like, this company, uh, it's got a 5 billion market cap um, and it's got a, a, an equity valuation of like 200 odd million or something and is loss making. All of that is totally and absolutely correct. I can't help wonder if we don't get a takeover offer here at some point. Some large player, uh, perhaps a helium player, uh, looks at this uh, market cap of five billion. Uh, what's that in dollars? Three hundred million dollars. Uh, put a sweetener in five hundred million dollars. That is a sixty rand share price takeover. So five hundred million to buy the asset. Eight hundred million. Uh, US dollars to get the phase two up and going. It's $1.3 million. It can probably do that back in the first three years of, 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 of profitability. So I, I can't help thinking that, that we might potentially see someone actually coming here for a, a takeover. Um, the big risk here is, of course, is execution. Yeah, they've got the reserves. Let's assume they get the money. They've got to execute on time, on budget, with a plant that works. Not a Madupi-style plant, a proper plant that actually works. So there is still some way to go there. Uh, Discam results, this one I don't own. Not a bad set of numbers out of Discam. Markets certainly like them. i tell you what struck me most about it. I mean, firstly, we, we're seeing... Uh, a lot around the, 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 the sort of retailers, Mass Marts, Mr. Price, uh, Discovery, etc., uh, getting really, really good sets of numbers coming through. Um, notwithstanding that this includes the July riots in KZN and to a lesser degree in, 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 in Gauteng. And I'll tell you why. You know what I think it is? It, it, it comes back to scale, right? <laughs> if you're the... <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're the discam, the clicks, the mass mart or something, and you get hit with a billion rand of, of, of damages through the right during the rights, you can fund that in the short term while right? you rate for Sasria. If Sasria only pay you seven hundred million, you can fund the other three hundred million yourself. I think they were much better positioned to withstand the, the fallout from the rights than the smaller sort of mom and pops, the the unlisted, the you know, a couple of chains or something. Um, I mean, what I like most about the discam story. And they've been slowly piecing this together with some acquisitions. So they're now putting nurses into the disc games. And you can go there for all your normal stuff, you know, uh, uh, blood test, glucose, uh, you know, cholesterol, hot, all of that sort of stuff. Um, you can obviously get jabs there, vaccines and everything. But in South Africa, where you've kind of got, at the one end, the poor and unemployed who are on the state, the richer employed who are on you know, their own medical aids, you've got that middle band, uh, which is you know, literally millions and millions of, of, of people, um, to whom they kind of don't, they, 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 you know, richer than what you would typically expect at a state hospital, but they're not a discovery client member yet either. And, and one of the big barriers, and this was chatting with uh, Roy Maria, the CFO, last week, one of the big barriers is that first doctor's visit. 
you know, 500, 800, 1,000 bucks just to walk into the doctor's consulting room and have them tell you, yes, you're sick, go get drugs. You knew you were sick. You just, you know, and, and 500, 1,000 bucks, whatever it might be, is, is, is a lot. You can go to a nurse. You go to a, a nurse at, at, at Discovery. She can see you. She can, if she needs to prescribe uh, prescription drugs, which need a doctor's signature, they do telemedicine for you. So there's a teledoc available. So they can remove that initial barrier of the 500 to 1,000 bucks for the GP. If you do need to upscale, you absolutely can. Um, and then, of course, they're also now moving into the health insurance. And notwithstanding, of course, is that now you've got the script. Where are you going to fill it? Well, you're already in Discam. So you're going to fill it at Discam. So I very much like this move uh, uh, in, in, into what we're, what, what we're seeing here. There's the other uh, small little medic medical aid administrator in, on, on the JSC uh, started by Maya Khan and the name is just slipped my head it'll come back to me ah, i'll ignore it for now it'll come back um and they're looking to do the same as well a giant sort of that untapped middle uh, offer them a health insurance offer them an easy access to a healthcare professional offer them the upskilling so what they do is imagine nurses at all the the disc games, um and then you just have a room of doctors somewhere who all uh, telemedicine right i mean i don't know is it, is it whatsapp is it zoom whatever it might be their own secure channel. So I, I thought decent results, and I, I like that. I've always preferred Mr. Price over Discam, but I like this move into health, health insurance from them. Uh, MTN, EJ, I see your question. So reports coming out this morning, uh, in fact, last night, that uh, MTN was looking to perhaps buy Telcom. Uh, Telcom apparently rebuffed the offer, and the stock is down today, although it's had a, a fairly good run, so we shouldn't begrudge them that. I mean, they are down, but uh, okay, they're only back at uh, uh, late 2019 levels. Telcom, very cash flush. Got a nice space with their, their mobile business, got their towers business, their property, lots in there that, that, that looks attractive. Um, but uh, the, the market seems to be saying that nah, not going to happen. I'm also not sure that the, that the South African competition authorities would allow it um, because, I mean, MTN is only number two, we can argue, but uh, certainly MTN is a big, a big player in South Africa and it would be number two swallowing number three. I don't see the Competition Commission allowing that, although i got to say I think our market is too big for four telcos. I think three is probably a better number. Heck, the U.S. only has four telcos, and they're, what, six times larger than us in terms of population. But a lot of really good news out of MTN. Um, really, really good update coming through on uh, Thursday last week. Um, they are repatriating money out of Nigeria, hand over fist. You know, as long as the oil price is high, Nigeria is happy because oil's high so they can fund their budgetary costs. As soon as oil collapses, then careful of Nigeria. But the new management team is going to be, they're much better. Well, what's, they, they're much more cognizant of regulators. Back in 2015, when they were getting bust, what was it, 5 billion US dollars, the management team were kind of middle finger to your regulator. I mean, they had been told to deregister unrecorded SIMs. They had been told repeatedly by the Nigerian regulator, and they just ignored it until the regulator found them 5 billion US dollars. Then suddenly they started to pay attention, negotiated the fine down and deregistered them. This new management team, I think, is much better. They've also got approval from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, this came through on Friday um, for their uh, operation of their MOMO license. Um, importantly, approval in, pr approval in principle. So the, basically the, the Central Bank of Nigeria said, okay, cool, we like this. You can put the formal application into the process, and let's take it from there. Um, so Nigeria looking at sorry Nigeria MTN looking really really good. 170 bucks. I mean it's it's uh, sort of getting back to uh, levels, but you know there was your house at 260. There was your Nigeria disaster. This is actually the price. I exited it about I think 173 174 back here in October 2015 uh, when that Nigeria story first broke, and my concern was really really, really simple. I had two of them. One was you should buy your regulator an Apple every Monday. You shouldn't be given the, the middle finger. The bigger thing is that I was on holiday, um, Shockers Rock in, in north coast of KZN, and, and I got a message from somebody in Nigeria saying, hey, there's a story in Nigeria about how the MTN's been fined $5 billion. 
you know, is it true? I'm like, well, I can't see anything on, on the interwebs, but surely, I mean, wow. Monday morning broke, and it took until 2 o'clock Monday afternoon for Nigeria for the MTN management to issue a sense announcement. By which time, I mean, Sense opens at 7 o'clock in the morning, right? So much time they'd had seven hours they had sat on the news. The market knew about it. I mean, absolutely, because by then it had been confirmed by the Nigerian regulators and press and everything else. And I just looked at a management team and said, you folks are, with respect, useless, and I'm taking my money somewhere else. And I did. And it, it exited, but this is a much better company. But be careful. When oil prices get weak again, then things will start to get messy again. That's just how it is. Talking of oil, let's quickly go over to oil. So, Petrol price increase, giant size petrol price. Uh, lots of 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 uh, oh, the government must change the structure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At current petrol tax is about six bucks and change. Yes, they could take the tax out and make it zero, but uh, I mean, and globally, our petrol price is below the medium, and that excludes oil producing nations who typically you know uh, uh, sponsor their own petrol. What we have seen in Brent is some weakness coming through, although a sudden run this morning. But that petrol price hurts, right? It costs us as individuals more money to move from A to B, which gives us less money in our pocket for disposable income to spend on on burgers or whatever the case may be. Um, particularly lower income people to whom a larger percentage of their paycheck goes on transport. Um, so that hurts them even more. Business, you know, uh, uh, check is moving their goods from uh, distribution centers to stores. Essentially, higher petrol price sucks money out of the economy. And it doesn't pay more tax because the tax is, is, is set at a, at a, in the budget. So the tax isn't a percentage. Tax is a rand and cents. So we don't suddenly get a whole lot more tax coming in either, but it does hurt. It is inflationary. We also, I was chatting with Wandili Shalobo uh, uh, from uh, AgriBiz last uh, Friday. Uh, agricultural economist uh, uh, around agri and, and we're seeing input cost pressures in the agri space now the commodity prices are still at at, at, at great levels um, down at the bottom here okay they're off today white maize 32 yellow maize 3400 uh, bread milling wheat 57 sunflower 10,700 that's insane uh, soya 7,000 those are all December futures um, they're still getting decent prices, but the levels are about 20-25% off the highs in most cases. Sunflower is still record levels. But more important than that, they're getting input costs. Uh, ESCOM, diesel, fertilizer. So farmers are starting to, to get a bit more pricing pressure. They're going to push that through to the, 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 the retailers as far as they are able to. The retailers will squeeze them, make no bones about that. But the, the run that we have seen in stocks such as Carp Agri, um, I think are probably uh, closer to an end than a, than, than a start. Um, and certainly there is a seller there at about the 45 rand level. Um, if we zoom this out a bit, uh, great run from, from uh, sort of end of last year, uh, more than doubling. I picked up some, I've taken my profit and run. Uh, but what we see here, is I think that farmers are going to have a less boom period. Uh, companies like Omnia, and they did an update today, they're going to have great numbers, right? Omnia is going to be because they're selling the fertilizer. Bigger picture, food prices, in, input costs on food increasing, push that through to the to the manufacturers and the retailers, uh, puts the Tiger brands under pressure. Uh, Carp Agri is not a farmer, but the farmers use Carp Agri's products, etc. Uh, Zeta, same story pressure coming through there uh some inflation building into the system uh, the 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 story there is starting to get a little bit bleak the reopening trade i'm still comfortable with famous brands uh being the one i hold spur looking the better value uh soho sun hotels uh also looking fairly good sun international run a whole big chunk amount um but that inflation pressure takes money out of consumers pockets so that's starting to perhaps look a little bit bleak there and ladies and gents, uh, that's me. We always finish a little bit earlier when we don't have a Dineo. Uh, depending on load scheduling schedules, no reason why we won't be back next Monday. We do run through to 13 December. will be the last one for the year. And I think, if memory serves, 18 January is when we are back in the new year. Uh, but we'll park it there. Everyone, have a great day further. Uh, stay safe. Look after yourself. If you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.